Good morning. It's almost lunchtime. I just want to thank everybody here. I'm going to give this over to Mr. Josiah in just one moment. <clears throat> My name is Carlos Salazar. I'm the uh, Director of Time Men of Diversity, Intercultural Engagement. And I'm going to give the time over to Mr. Josiah in just one moment. But I do want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, it's a great day. And we got Mr. Richard Jurgen and his family here. Thank you very much. And as we like to say here, I know some of the guys we like to say, we said last night, but when I say uno, dos, tres, what comes after that? We say, vamos, Titans. Okay, but I want it loud. We're going to say, vamos, Titans. All right. I'm going to say, uno, dos, tres. And I want to hear, vamos, Titans. Three times. Three times. Ready? Uno, dos, tres. Vamos. 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 Gracias. Um, greetings, everybody. Um, hello, my name is Josiah Benjamin. I'm a senior here at the university, major in human service leadership, minor in African American studies. Um, I'm also, I'm also a proud member of Alpha, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and I'm the president here of the chapter that's here at UWO. Um, and I'm also a member of Gentlemen of Excellence under the Titan Men of Diversity Program here at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. So the Tommy Thomason Center is delighted to be able to sponsor today's event. The man is greater than a bear building men of character, Richard Jurgen III. Many thanks to our UWO partners and families that made this possible. Chancellor Andrew Levitt, Debbie J, Kimberly Prophet, Mike Leader, Byron Adams, Daryl Sims, Abby Gildernick, uh, Aladdin Catering, Titan Men of Diversity, Gentlemen of Excellence, Richard Jurgen III, his wife Kayla, his mother-in-law and his wonderful children, as well as the Thompson Center staff. Alex Roof and Mary Kate. For those unfamiliar with the Thomason Center, let me say a few words about it. The Thomason Center was established to follow in the footsteps of Governor Tommy Thomason, who proudly worked with colleges on both sides of the aisle to advance the public good. The Thomason Center seeks to carry on Governor Thompson's legacy by informing and inspiring current and future public leaders, fostering leadership skills and promoting effective public leadership. They work to further these goals by offering public events, funding research and scholarships, honoring exemplary public leaders with the Distinguished Public Leadership Award and conducting other activities across all UWL campuses. All the events are free and open to the public. For more information on their upcoming events, grant opportunities, and other aspects of centers, please visit the Thompson Center website. Now presenting, the man is greater than the brand, building men of character, Richard Jurgen III. Thank you. Test. Okay, I gotta bring us closer. Hello, hello. All right. Uh, my name is Matt Spadoni. I am the president of Gentlemen of Excellence here on campus. I am like a junior, senior type beat on uh, campus here. Uh, I'm very thankful for you guys to get out here and very happy we we're able to put this on. Hello, my name is Martin Gonzalez. I'm a junior here at UWO. I'm a criminal justice major and I'm the vice president here of Gentlemen of Excellence. All right, so let's get started here. So all the questions here are going to be based on Richard's book, uh, Shedding Past Brokenness to Live in Ki as Kings and Queens, The Man is Greater Than the Brand, which is now being sold at the bookstore here. Uh, you can also get it like on Amazon, a couple other options. So for our first question, Richard, in your book, Shedding Past Brokenness Lives in Kings and Queens, The Man is Greater Than the Brand, you say, each of us depends on something of value, like identity or purpose. In the past, you saw football as that value. Today, what would you say that value is in your life? Vulnerability. Um, for me, there's value in being vulnerable with people because along my life's journey, I had a large number of focus put on football, right? Like if, if I told you the amount of hours, if I told you the amount of stress that was placed on me to try to appease and please and perform, um, you know, in order to gain the attention of the NFL, like my whole life. Right. And in, in investing and in putting everything on the line every day um, is tough. Right. And so for me, I learned that my vulnerability is where my value is. Right. And me sharing and giving and and, and, and inspiring people, you know, with speaking. Right. And, and with sharing through teaching, with sharing through the research that I'm doing. Right. So I'm, I'm vulnerable because. 
everything that I do revolves around me giving back to other people. And at this season and in this space, in this place in my life, right? Like I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a speaker, I'm all these things. But at the end of the day, right? Like I'm still a man. I still struggle. I still have parts of me that are broken, that need healing. And I'm willing to do the work. I'm willing to put the time in for the inner me as opposed to the outer me and the football me, right? At this place in this space in my life. So um, I would definitely say vulnerability is where my value is now. For sure, for sure. Richard, as a boy, you went through many hardships. One was losing your pillar in life, your grandmother. Tell us about her and how she was a North Star for you. Man, you just lit me up when you asked that question because I immediately go back to the first grade when, you know, you start learning how to add, remember, you know, your your your, uh, your reading, writing, and arithmetic skills. Um, and so oftentimes I would come home from school on a daily basis and, you know, plop right onto the floor open up my lesson and we would do more school. Like I was so in love with school and so in love with pursuing God and so in love with just the process of coming home and unwinding with my grandmother, right? And um, that was because she was an early childhood intervention specialist um, and she understood the assignment that she had not just be my grandmother, but to be a conduit of faith and someone who was going to lead me through education, right? And that was just kind of the door and the vessel to like really strengthen our bond. So I would come home, pull out my lesson, reformat everything that I did that day in school. She would go through everything with me. We would attack big words. We learned that words are friends. And she started developing my vocabulary beyond what I could have ever thought, think, and or imagine. And I was reading novels and writing and doing all kind of stuff from the first through the third grade so when I got you know to the third grade and you know when she <clears throat> got sickly um, after having had a stroke and ended up dying and passing you know within three to six months um, it was devastating for me and it was hard to pick up a pen and write again it was hard to sit on the floor and laugh after school. It was hard to do something without your North Star being physically present in your life. And um, loss forces you to reevaluate things. And it puts you in a place in a space where, again, you're vulnerable um, because you don't have that protection, that guiding light. And so I'm sure as we'll get into it, you know, it it led to a lot of, built up anger, built up resentment because I didn't have the one person who I felt like truly loved me and was steering me and guiding me anymore. Thank you. So both through hearing you speak, <clears throat> excuse me, and reading your book, um, you know, we know that you went kind of down a slippery slope in public school. Uh, can you kind of explain to us why morals and ethics are a very key part of being, you know, just a person and a student athlete? Those are your foundational principles. Um, you know, for me, I had been in private school the majority of my uh, early childhood upbringing. My parents sacrificed and they did what was necessary to put me ahead of the neighborhood in which I grew up in and the community that I was surrounded by. Um, and so, you know, for me, being in isolation for so long and then finally going to school with your friends in sixth grade, it was tough because in sixth grade, you start to really develop your identity. I started off in the gifted learners program and pre-law pursuing wanting to be a lawyer one day. Um, you know, and by the seventh grade, I was kicked out of that program and I was skipping school, shooting dice, selling weed and um, just, just into some stuff. Right. And it wasn't until eighth grade when I realized one day, um, you know, when I was pretty much at the point where either you're going to stay back in eighth grade or you're going to progress to the ninth grade if you commit to going to Saturday school. So I had to commit to going to Saturday school every Saturday. There was one particular Saturday where I decided that I was going to skip with one of my buddies, Marcus, who's now serving 25 years in prison. Um, and 
I was going to, you know, we we're going to smoke some weed. We were going to hang out. We were going to do it all within the time frame that I was supposed to be in class. So my, my plan was, okay, I'm going to uh, write this paper real quick. I didn't put my name on it. I left it and I left the class. And so as I'm leaving the class, Marcus meets me. We're running out of the school. Security is chasing us, and I could hear this voice in the back of my head pounding like, man, go back and get that paper. You didn't put your name on it. And I ignored it. I didn't listen, right? And so I hadn't really written like this in probably the last four to five years. As I mentioned, I put the pen down in third grade because I was it was too hard to write and to talk about what I was feeling. But it was like in that moment, I put everything I could into that one paper, and I remember it. And as I'm jumping the gate and as I'm walking and I'm getting ready to light up this blunt with Marcus and do our thing, it's like the floodgates of heaven opened and I see my father beelining down the street in the van. And so at this time, my father was faced with incarceration for vehicular homicide, um, second felony he was faced with. So he was, he was dealing with it, right? He was going through some some real life grown man stuff as well as dealing with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of cancer. And it was 08 and the recession was bad. And my mother was struggling doing hair. So, you know, for me, I I was in a place in space where I, I, I knew when my dad snatched me up and grabbed me in that van, that everything that he had to say to me, the one thing I remember, is he said a lot and it was not nice. Um, you're not cheating me, you're cheating yourself. And at the end of the day, you know, the way you're acting out and the things that you're doing, you're going to end up down a path that you don't want to go. And I'm telling you this from experience, right? Like I've been to prison. I've been where you don't want to go. I've been, or I could potentially be going back. So I'm trying to help save you from not going down this path. And, you know, that, that day, I remember something just breaking in me, man. Like Marcus B lines and goes left. And I'm standing there and it's just me and my dad just going at it. And as he takes me back into the school, I'm sitting there in the principal's, outside of the principal's office, he's in the principal's office talking to them in guidance. And a friend of mine that I was actually working on the paper with, because it was a collaborative group writing class, comes up to me and says, hey, you know, I think that was your paper that the teacher was referring to. She said it didn't have a name on it and that you know, if this person, whoever this is, would ever come to class and show up and be present, they might actually be something one day. And um, those words still, res still resonate with me now. And so I think the three things that you mentioned is how you show up on a daily basis, right? And so from that story, what I want you all to extract is go back and put your name on whatever gift it is that you left behind a long time ago, right? Like start waiting for somebody or something to happen for you to then respond years later and you might miss that opportunity that was there before you actually missed the opportunity because we miss the opportunities that we don't take, not the ones that we end up do taking. So as you're going through, you know, you all's process and you're thinking about what morals is, what character means um, and what respect is, you know, first you have to respect the game. You have to respect the process because at the end of the day, you know, I, in that moment, I didn't respect the process. I didn't. I didn't respect the craft. I just took it for granted. And these were all things that, you know, ultimately were going to pay it for for me now at, at 26. And so I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Richard. You mentioned in your book that God shows himself today and speaks to us in specific forms. Can you expand on your faith and how God speaks to us today? So there's this blind man and there's an alligator, right? So the blind man, he walks down into the pool full of alligators. Then there's another man that walks into the pool that can see. He sees the alligators and he reacts and he freaks out. And so the alligators eat him. But you know why they don't eat the blind man? Because he's calm. He can't see. So he's walking by faith and not by sight. And so when he's in the water with the alligators, 
he's coasting. And so the alligators coast because they react based on how you react. So he doesn't know how to react. So all he's doing is responding to the fact that he's in the water. It might be a little cold. It might be a little whatever. He might bump into an alligator, but he doesn't know because he can't see. And so the thing I want you all to understand and know about me is I've been walking blind my whole life. I've been walking in the blessings. I've been walking in the situations where it's like, how did you come out of that alive? You don't look like what you've been through. And it's because the evidence of faith is in the things that are unseen, not the things that you actually see. And what I mean by that is, look, right? Like I'm on a mission and a, a, a journey to inspire and impact the world so that I can one day receive a Nobel Peace Prize. Now, th th there's no 100% guarantee that I will ever receive a Nobel Peace Prize, but I'm on a blind walk. And I know there's a lot of alligators and sharks and things that I'm going to have to go through which I would consider to be, in you all's terms, opposition, adversity, right? And am I going to look at it and panic? Or am I going to wait and respond, right? Because 10% of life is what happened. 90% is how you responded to it. Thank you. So in this fast-paced world, um, you know, how can you advise us to slow down and listen to people who want to share life's, you know, good advice with us? Listen with your eyes, not just with your ears. Believe what you see, not what you hear. People will tell you a lot of stuff. But if you, so like for me, right, like my new, my new thing is observations because I'm taking a qualitative research course for my doctoral work. So I'm starting to look at things with a different lens, right? And so even though I'm present in this room and I'm speaking, I'm still surveying and scanning the room and connecting with each and every one of you because that's what's most important to me right now in this moment. And so reframe, reframe that question. So in, in the world today, everybody moves at like a, a very fast pace. Right. And you, you, it's kind of hard to see who's out for you and who's right. out against you. You know, how do you slow down and decipher between people that are against you, people that are for you? Right. Take notes of everything, verbal and nonverbal that's happening. Right. And it's again, it's not with your ears. You listen with your eyes. Right. Believe what you see, not everything you hear. And so a lot of times, oftentimes, right, we're in rooms, we're in situations where a lot of information is being dished out, but we don't think it applies to us. But that's selfish because it might apply to someone else. So if you could pick up something and take note on something that you can help be an answer or a solution to somebody else for, then that's where the real value is, right? It's like you want to be a sponge in every situation because you don't know who may benefit from the information that you have, right? And it might not be for you, but it could be for someone else. And I think when we lead with that mindset, it changes the narrative around how we look at things. And again, like I said, for me, you know, going back and now receiving a PhD, like I'm in class with some people that they are some of the smartest people in this world and I feel intimidated. And so I have to slow down, go back, ask questions, spend extra time in office hours with my professor. I'm a professor, I got students. I have to balance and do all these things, but I know all this information and receiving this doctorate isn't for me. It's for another young man in Fort Lauderdale that went through what I went through. And one day when I go back and I show up and I talk to him, he's going to hear me and listen to me different because he could see his vision is clear. I don't have to get on the mic and tell him what I've been through and all this. And for him to believe me, he'll look at me and see that there's evidence that he can do it. Thank you. Besides your grandmother sharing good advice to you, you mentioned that your older brother was also there in your life. Can you share about how he's also been an advocate for you? So when you call someone right after you've almost just died, right? So June 3rd, 2017, I'll never forget. The first phone call that I made after having broken my neck in a severe car wreck, 2,000 pounds comes crashing down on my neck and splits me in half down to my core like an apple. The first thing I did was pick up the phone and call my brother um, to let him know that, one, I'm still alive. Two, I don't know what you got to do, but get here now. And three um tell mom and dad i love them and we go from there and so that's always been our relationship right it's like 
whenever I'm in trouble, whenever I have had the gun to my head and wanted to blow my brains out and commit suicide or whenever, uh, you know, I'm checking into or checking out of rehab for, uh, you know, substance abuse or alcohol abuse, the first person that I would call is my brother. And that was, that's just always how life has been, even from the time I was a young boy. We're 11 and a half years apart for a reason, right? So he's two to three steps ahead of me in everything in life. And so I've always been trying to play catch up to him in terms of my maturity, because I saw a lot at a young age. I was exposed to a lot at a young age. And, you know, as I've, as I've grown and as I've matured, the level of respect that I have for him has matured and has grown also because I realized you know, our relationship was one-sided for so long. He's been there for me. When have I ever really been there for him? You see what I'm saying? So it's kind of like now as a grown man, it's like, man, for the last 26 years, you've been cleaning up my vomit, wiping my butt, doing everything like I'm a baby, right? Because I'm your baby brother. But at some point in time, the relationship needs to be reciprocal. And so that's where we are now. And it's a beautiful thing. Thank you. So... We know you love to connect with people. Um, you know, kind of what advice do you have for our UWO students, faculty, staff to be intentionally minded in connecting with their either community and their peers? Take off the mask, right? Quit playing around and quit talking about your title. Quit living by the world standard of looking at the outward of appearance and not looking at the inward of appearance, right? Like when you show up in spaces, bring all of you. Don't just bring parts of you because then you're cheating everybody else in the room and yourself. Um, because guess what? The best connections and the best relationships are forged in some of the ugliest circumstances. I could have just had conflict with you yesterday and we can be business partners next year. You know, like that, that's how it is. Like you, you might've had a fight with a guy at a party over a girl. And then you'll look back a year later before graduation, y'all might be in a study group and you might say to him, hey man, I didn't know you were interested in the same thing that I was studying. You still talking to that girl? He's like, bro, no, I'm not. And it's like, oh, really? And it's like, it's like, oh, okay. So now we're past like all of that. Like we could actually talk. Like I see you, right? Like I see what you're thinking. I see how you're moving. I see what you're doing. And I want to give you your flowers while you're here. And I think a lot of times we miss those opportunities because we get so caught up in the external factors and we don't look at the inward of appearance of a person and realize like, hey, you have issues just like I have issues, but I'm not going to judge you, right? And I'm going to love on you just as much as I'm going to, you know, give you the opportunity to show me and prove to me that, like, there is another side to humanity. And that humanity is not only what they put on the news or the propaganda, of what they put in the media, you know, but you could actually redefine that narrative yourself with how you show up again for people and in, 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 in the leverage that you that you give. Thank you very much. All right. Let's talk Clemson football. <laughs> All right. Tell us about your time there, championships, the role players, the environment. Um, where do I start? A culture like none other. I mean, I came to Clemson at the right time, right? Any sooner, any later might have been a disaster. And I say that not lightly, I say that with the utmost confidence because when I came in in 2014, I wasn't promised anything. Just be honest, right? Like a lot of schools I won't mention offered money, offered this, offered that. Clemson was like, hey, you, you, you're the guy. We think you're nice. You know, you're four or five star, all American, all these things. But you see all these defensive ends we got? Go learn from them for a couple of years. And then, you know, you'll get your opportunity. I'm like, Notre Dame promised me I was probably going to come in and start and play. Um, University of Texas offered me to come in and potentially start and play, and you guys are just offering me the opportunity to come here and develop. I'll come here and develop because I knew I was 17 at the time when I went to college, and there was a lot of immaturity. Even though I was a big kid, I was always a year ahead, and so I needed that year to develop behind a first-round draft pick like Vic Beasley. I needed another year. To, to develop behind a guy like Shaq Lawson, Kevin Dyes of the world, um, guys that were going first round. Um, because, I, you know, when I first got to college, man, I tell you this, um, first semester, 2.0 GPA, almost flunked out because I was depressed that I was red shirting and that I wasn't going to be the center of attention of the team. 
And I was a distraction. You know, I spent that time drinking it away, smoking it away, whatever it away, because me and my father weren't on good terms. And, you know, I went to college with a lot of baggage. And even though I had that baggage and that weight on me, the environment was just so positive that it overshadowed my negativity that I was living with internally. And I decided to immerse myself in the process and get pickled. Um, and so for me, man, you know, it, by the time I hit the midpoint of my spring semester, I was now on the president's list. I was on my way to receiving multiple internship opportunities, deciding, to, you know, I wanted to go back and pursue law again, sport law. Um, so, you know, I took advantage, man, of all the opportunities, whether that was on the field or off the field, you know, good or bad, right? Like I've seen it and done it. And um, that's what made our team so special, man, was it was a, not just guys such as myself, but there were guys from all different backgrounds and doing different things that wanted more out of life than just football. And we made that a thing in our class when we came in was that the man would be greater than the brand, right? And that we would leave this place better than we found it. And I could tell you two championships later and a slew of college football appearances and, you know, being featured, you know, at the White House and doing all these things, that was the brand, but the man or the men behind the program, you know, playing for somebody such as Coach Dabo Sweeney, you know, high man of care, right? Like, will literally give you the shirt off his back. If he, you know, doesn't have the shirt, he'll go borrow a shirt and make sure you have a shirt and he might not have one, right? And so playing for somebody like that and now working alongside somebody like that every day, I mean, it gives you a great, uh, a great level of perspective. Um, and, and it, what it does is it challenges you to continue to live by a code every day. And that code is, you know, treat others how you would like to be treated. And that was one of the biggest things that I learned, you know, during my time at Clemson in undergrad and graduate school coaching. And now, you know, as a professor and, a, you know, just it's, um, it, it's a special place in my heart. And, um, you know, I met my lovely wife there. Um, yeah, just so many things, man. I, you get me going when you talk. We ask me to talk about Clemson, man. I can just go in circles. So I hope I answered your question. Yeah, you did. Thank you. So staying staying on the topic of uh, Clemson football, how much would you say you know your former coach Dabo and you know other coaching staff there helped in in development of your character and character maturization? So Coach Sweeney and I had this conversation leading into that spring semester where I had to make that transition academically in order to you know, stay eligible to be able to play that either you're going to get right or get left, right? So, you know, one evening, uh, it was about 12 in the morning. I'm out past curfew with my roommate at the time. Um, and, you know, we have two bottles of alcohol in the car and we're about to go to the club in Greenville and have a good time. You know, as young 18-year-olds, uh, you know, thinking not with the right head. And um, we get pulled over get pulled over by campus police actually right outside of the president's house and we're in handcuffs on the ground. He's doing a sobriety walk test and I'm passed out in the passenger seat. And, you know, I could just remember being in shock when I had to call coach Sweeney's right hand man to say, Hey, can you come get us out of jail? And luckily for us, they didn't physically take us, but that went down as an arrest on my record and a minor in possession can definitely hold you back later on in life if you don't get it cleared up. So, you know, man, I had to go through months of AA, um, you know, months of community service, um, you know, just really, really, really getting back on his good side, right? Like Coach Sweeney has this saying, how much money you got in the bank with me? And at the time I had to make a significant withdrawal. Um, it almost put me at a deficit financially with him. And um, I, I went through that process with humility, with dignity. And I learned from that, you know, you have to hold yourself accountable to a standard, right? And, you know, that, that forged me into becoming um, a leader on the team, right? And, you know, being a part of Sweeney Councils, being a part of um, SAC, you know, Student Athlete Advisory Committees, being, being someone that I never thought that I could be from where I came from, um, you know? And so I, I would say, man, listen, you know, when it comes to character development, 
when it comes to Clemson, this isn't a commercial, but we do it right, you know? And so, I, you know, I'm 20, like I said, 26 now, looking back on it. Um, man, those were, those were the foundational pieces that gave me uh, everything that I needed to, to make it through life. Thank you very much. No, if you please talk to us about the day you were involved in that car accident. What went through your mind? What was your reaction? My response and my reaction that day and what was going through my mind, I appreciate the question. What was going through my mind that day was this. You don't know what's on the other side of you waking up from this hospital bed and walking, but whatever it is, you're alive. So why not you instead of why you, right? Because the first 24 hours, it was why me? Why am I laying here flat with a neck brace and I can't walk and I'm on paralysis watch? And, you know, my room is filled with, you know, coaches, teammates, people that love me and care about me. But the reality is, guess what? Life goes on, right? And in that moment, I thought about, you know, laying out on the practice field and, you know, when you're injured, and there's practice going on and you're injured, what tends to happen is they just move practice up and you're there with the trainers and left to deal with what you got to deal with. And then the coaches come to you afterwards. So in that moment, it was hard for people to meet me where I was. It was hard to know what to say to me. It was hard to tell me, hey, man, everything was going to be all right. But that's what Coach Sweeney did for me. In that moment, it was like, what was I thinking? I was thinking, man, my life is over. And my my reaction was, what am I going to do next? And so I, I reacted and I said, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start writing. So the very next day when I got out of the hospital, my reaction was, go back to the third grade, you that didn't respond the right way or react the right way and do it this time, right? Like loss forces you to reevaluate some things in your life. Loss forces you to get more focused, get more serious. And so Man, I started charting my journal every day of recovery, good, bad, indifferent, ugly. Um, and it helped me to regain my strength to walk. I truly believe that by me strengthening myself with my rhetorical skills and reading and strengthening my mind and challenging myself beyond my body, that's what actually gave me my physical strength. Back. It wasn't PT. It wasn't lifting weights. It was the mental investment that I made in myself. It was the emotional detachment that I had from football. And once I transitioned and I responded and became a coach, I got my master's degree. And that ultimately catapulted me back into playing football at Boston College. Thank you. All right, so um, we know you're pretty religious. Uh, can you explain to us how the biblical friendship story of David and Jonathan inspired you to be a, a, you know, a major leader? So there's a story in the Bible and I'm not gonna preach. I'm just gonna give you all a thought of the day. Saul was king, and Jonathan was his son, and David was the heir to the throne. Doesn't make sense, right? So David comes, shows up. Jonathan undresses himself and says, David, you're the one, not me. I'm the two. But my dad is currently the one, and you're going to be the one to supersede my dad. So he knew then when David arrived and when David showed up that David had something that he didn't have, but he could help David get what he needed and what he wanted and what was already his. And so when I say that, a lot of times we're called to do a lot of work, but very few of us get chosen and put in place to do the actual work. A lot of people get the call. Only a few of them answer and show up and they're ready. And so I think in that moment, David already had gotten the call when he was out in the field doing the work, right? David was a shepherd boy. He was a nobody. He was, a, he was in the Bible, somebody that like, why would God use him, right? Like he's not the one, but it wasn't about what everyone else said about him. He was a leader from the day that he was born for the plans that his mother and everybody knew like David would be the one. And so Sometimes in life, we need someone to help us carry the mantle as a leader, right? Because you can't lead alone. You want to go fast, go alone. You want to go further. The two of them went together. And eventually, they were able to take hold of the kingdom from Saul.
And so for me, you know, I don't seek to ever man maliciously uh, manipulate my way into a situation, but I do believe in, you know, manifestation, right? And being in the right places at the right time so that you can receive what's ultimately been ordained for you. You mentioned in Romans 12, 2, out of your book, too. You uh, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How has this biblical verse been a beacon of light to you? It just opened up a table for me just now to think back to the fact that when I, when I really grasped hold of that scripture, I was in the air on a private plane headed to the State House of South Carolina with Coach Sweeney, Hunter Refro and a good friend of mine is Mila Richard. And as we're in the air, Coach Swinney said these words, and then he followed it by saying, we got all the spotlight on us, little old Clemson. We ain't won a national championship in over 30 years, and now everybody calls us the standard of college football in 2016 as we're winning our first, second national championship, first in a long time. He was like, but don't be fooled by all these people that are building us up. Because when we walk in this state house, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to want to tear us down after they've built us up. So the reality is when we walk out of here and we get back on this plane and we get back in the air, renew your mind to go back to work. And so every day I get up, it's not about what I'm trying to accomplish. It's not about a promise. It's more or less about the process, the process of the renewal of the mind, the process of crucifying your flesh daily, the process of surrendering every day to something, submitting to someone higher than you. Like we all have somebody we have to report to. I had to report to God, then I got to report to my wife. That's my CEO, that's my boss, right? She tells me which way to go, here's your clothes, here's what you're eating today, here's what you're doing. Like, so we all have a place and a space where we have to go to in order to renew ourselves before we are out into the world, right? And so, Every day before I wake, I have the same routine because I'm like, mm, go to work, Let's go to work today, like it's time. And so that whole concept, that whole mindset, um, you know, that was discovered in the air with Coach Sweeney, it's just never left me. It's always been my, whenever I'm having a down moment, I think about that private jet. That's right. That was a good conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Yes, sir. So you, you wrote in your book that you were not an angel. Um, you were, in fact, caught out after curfew in your car with alcohol and drunk. So, you know, how can we kind of like learn from major mistakes like that in our lives? It could either define you or develop you, right? So, you know, what's the difference between a drug addict and a, and a prostitute? Both sin, right? I mean, they both, if you look at them, you're like, well, they should be together. But the prostitute might end up marrying the governor of the state and the drug addict might end up being a CEO of a company one day. You never judge a man or somebody by where they stand in times of comfort and convenience, but where they stand in times of challenge and controversy. And so I think a lot of times, right, like we look at people and we write them off based on what they did and don't look at them for who they actually can be and who they are right now doesn't reflect that but we all have a journey and things that we have to go through in life in order to grind us up so we can be shined up. Right. And so I think when you lead with that mentality that I'm, I'm, I'm looking for opportunities to grow, I'm looking for opportunities to fail. That's when you succeed. Thank you very much. Today you are married and have two children. What makes you a good father? What makes you a good husband? And what makes you a good teammate? I'm me at every single facet of those titles that you just mentioned like I don't switch who I am right like there's a standard there's non-negotiables and there's priorities right so the standard is no matter the down and distance I'm going to serve God first I'm going to serve others second and myself third in that order I'm a man of character that operates out of his faith and everything that I do exemplifies integrity honor and courage and excellence to the highest degree. So what that means is my vision and my mission keep me in alignment. And so no matter what circumstance or, or condition I'm in, you know, in any of those roles or titles, right? Like I'm still me at my core. And so I don't have to hit an on and off switch. Like my wife is sitting right there. My mother-in-law is sitting right there. My children are here with me. 
So in order for you to receive me, you got to accept them. And so everywhere I go, anything I do, it's not about me. It's about the, the little people. It's about the ones coming up behind me. It's about my legacy. It's about my lineage. It's about protecting the brand, but also developing the man each and every day and realizing that, you know, it's, it's a process. Again, you know, that word process, you'll hear me say that Tom um, blue in the face because, you know, we're, we're all striving to be something, to do something. And the non-negotiable is I won't quit. I'm going to fail getting it right, not fail because I got it wrong. Thank you. So we, we've had a great conversation today and we've learned a lot about your, you know, your past life experiences. Please tell us, you know, what is the path to success? The path to success is based on how many people you bless, right? So you measure success based on what you're able to do with what you have and who you're able to bless with what you have. And so for me, until I'm able to bless 10,000 people, feed a thousand kids in Africa every summer, fly across the world and give away tons of money. I haven't done anything yet. So I'm just scratching the surface of what I'm doing because I mean, yeah, I could take care of my household. I could take care of myself, but can you open doors for other people? Because when you open doors for other people, you never have to worry about what success looks like because everybody's going to always hold you accountable to being a success, right? Like you don't ever, Oh, I'm not successful today. Like what does success look like? Right. It looks like, the people in the room or the people that you're in rooms with respecting you enough to make sure that you never have to question where you stand in life, right? Like they're going to always make sure you're good because you made sure that they were good. And, and ultimately, you know, I don't worry about how am I going to pay for my kid's college fund. I already know it's worked out. I already know it's paid for. I don't worry about, you know, how am I going to be able to um, afford me and my wife's dream home, right? Like we're already living in it. I don't worry about, you know, what car is coming out next year. I love the one I currently got. And if I want to trade it in, I will, right? Like success won't be determined by my house, my car, you know, whether or not I can send my kids to college because I already know that what I'm doing is taking care of all that. So if I just keep doing that and turn it up and do it at a level that nobody else is doing it, when I'm done and when I die and that dash closes from 1996 to whenever, it'll be legendary. For sure. Thank you. Richard, what's going on in your life today? Uh, Well, you know, it, that's a loaded question, man. We're going to have to kind of simplify that because <laughs> today in my life, I'll tell you this, I'm going through a season of make room, right? So name it, right? Like, so you have to name the season that you're in. And this season, I'm developing the depth and the capacity to be able to outlast anything I go through, not outrun it. And so what that looks like and what I mean by that is nobody's going to beat me at being a better husband than, than I currently am because I'm, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so fixated and focused on loving my wife. Like I did when I was 18 years old, that everything that I do every day, as long as she cares about what I'm doing and she's invested, I'm winning. I don't care about anything else. I could write the worst paper tomorrow. My professor can give it back to me and say, you're a PhD student. I don't care. My wife loved me. Like, that's how I feel. And so every room, everywhere I show up, as long as she with me, I must be doing something right. Right. Because, you know, that's just where I'm at in my life. And so, man, I, you know, I, I encourage each and every one of you today. Don't run it. Don't 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 try to out just outrun it. Make sure you outlast it. Build uncommon stamina. Like, that's where I'm at in my life is I, I, I'm I'm developing so many traits, so many skills, and, and learning so many things on a daily basis as a scholar um, that I, I have to embrace that that mindset of growth. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Richard. Um, thank you, guests. I now want to open it up for um, Q&A. So if you have a question, raise your hand and you the mic. Yes, sir.
preferences for the prices that we can share for our coaches there. How you interacted with uh, the coaches in Clemson, mm -hmm. what you learned from those from this position to share um, what our coach did, how you can do it. Everyone knows that the landscape of college sports have changed now due to name, image, and likeness. There's, let's address the elephant in the room, right? And so we all have a part to play in developing name, image, and likeness, not from a monetary standpoint, but from a holistic view, right? Like, so the academics and the athletics and their personal lives, right? Like in a lot of times when, you know, you go off to college, um, you're, that's your first time you're, free, right? You have this, this thing called freedom. Um, and so freedom comes with choice, right? And so the choices that we make oftentimes reflect, you know, our upbringing, um, our experiences and how we view life. And so for me, I, I view life like this, like if the dice are in my hand, I'm gonna roll them and I'm a bet on me. And I had to learn that Right. Like life isn't a crapshoot. Life isn't a game of, of 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 dice like life is chess. Right. You have to be very logical and strategical in your thinking. And so as you're developing a plan A and a plan B, stop thinking that way because you're already preparing yourself for failure, basically, by saying this is my plan B. No, you have a dual plan A. So your plan A that you really love should mirror the plan A that you don't really think you might have to do so academically and athletically. You got to want it, right? So you have to stay ready so you don't have to get ready. So as coaches, right, like if you aren't able to sit down and clearly talk to your players and get them from point A to point B, you have to ask yourself, are you ready, right? Like, do like so, so are you willing to coach them beyond their failures? Because they're going to fail, like when they come in, right? Like the reality is they're going to go to that party that maybe you're like, huh, you probably shouldn't do that. Or they're going to be late on that assignment and they're going to want to hit the professor up on the side. They won't want to have it reported over to athletics as far as, oh, I didn't turn my assignment in. But you all will still know, right? There's accountability on every level. And so I think for me, what changed my perspective and what I would tell the younger me is stay the course, right? Like when I first got to Clemson, I didn't trust the process. I thought I was the process. I thought I was bigger than the program. I thought I was or I should because of where I come from and what I had overcame. So I, I had this mentality, like, you can't tell me nothing, right? Like I came out of high school as a top five African-American scholar athlete in the country, spoke at the White House, had a 4.5 GPA. I run circles around this campus. I went and studied up under the best people in high school, two Catholic private high schools and, and a Jewish private high school for academics and athletics. And I balanced being in student government, being involved in all these things. like. Literally, so my mind was, I'm already beyond college. I'm ready for the NFL. But I didn't realize that physically, right, like you might be 6'5 and you're 14, and then you wonder why his development is off. Like, oh, he's a grown man. No, he's not. He's a little boy, right? And so the reality is, is you get these 17, 18-year-olds coming to college, and you're like, oh, that's a grown man. Well, he's not. He's still got some little boy in him. She's still got some little girl in her. And so we have to take them from boy man to being a king by the time they leave or a girl woman to being a queen by the time she leaves because the reality of it is you're going to see them through that full process of maturation and so you're going to be the farmer that plants the seed and the day that you plant the seed is the day that you receive the harvest and so that's the frustrating part is we don't know when the harvest is going to return which is a fully developed young man or young woman who's going to go off to society and be a productive citizen and accomplish the things that they set out to do long before they even knew they set out to do them. And so the hard part is, is breaking down the intersection of their identity with outweighing academics or overriding athletics and trying to overcompensate in certain areas in this. And so I think a lot of it comes down to doing that internal work, right, with them as opposed to just focusing on the external factor of NIL. I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, being willing, like I said earlier, to be vulnerable with them and build trust, right, through being transparent with them. Um, you know, again, facilitating meaningful workshops, impactful professional personal development opportunities and not just checking the box. Um, you know, I think 
that looks like creating a community where feedback is the fertilizer for growth and you know so on and so forth and so i think when you put those measures in place those are the things that you don't see the result right away but eventually when the tables turn you're like wow we did that you know and look at them go right the bird has left the nest and so um you know i just those are the things that i would leave you all with so Does anybody have any other questions? No? Yeah, we're good. <laughs> I think we're good. All right. Yeah. Oh, so can we give another round of applause for Richard? Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, Richard and Kayla, we, we want to we do want to thank you for coming to our university. And we got a couple of things here uh, for you. We uh, This is for your kids, yeah. right? Thank so you. we got a little Titan dolls there, but uh, for your what? Let's put it right here for a moment. Oh, yeah. Because we believe in being Titans here. Yes. So we got your Rommel oh, Titans shirt. Here you go. Right. Here you go, Rommel Titans. We also have one for you, Kayla. So, because yes. I know you, they're going to bookstores. I know, don't, don't worry about that. We we got you connected. Thanks, so, thanks, thanks. we got you here. I'm sure for you as well as Bible Science. So, once again, we want to thank all of you here today for coming and listening to Mr. Richard Gergen the third. Thank you uh, for driving up all the way from Clemson. You drove up. Okay, we we're going to bring him in the UWO uh, uh, Concord, but, but we decided to uh, you could just drive up. Sorry, Chad, sir, but I know it's kind of busy, so it's a late hour. <laughs> all right, exactly. Thank you again. Thank you, gentlemen, for all your help. And vamos. Oh, before I forget, today it's Sage, 1210, yes, uh, 1210 at 7 p.m. We invite all of you again and your students to come listen to them again. Yeah. And we're also going to be at UWO Fox tomorrow. So yeah. thank you again. Vamos, signs. Adios. Adios.